Hi, and welcome to Micron's fourth quarter 2024 financial call. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. After the speaker's presentation, there will be a question and answer session. To ask a question during this session, you will need to press star 11 on your telephone. If your question has been answered and you'd like to remove yourself from the queue, simply press star 11 again. As a reminder, today's program is being recorded. And now I'd like to introduce your host for today's program, Satya Kumar, Investor Relations. Please go ahead, sir. Thank you, and welcome to Micron Technologies' fiscal fourth quarter 2024 financial conference call. On the call with me today are Sanjay Mehrotra, our President and CEO, and Mark Murphy, our CFO. Today's call is being webcast from our Investor Relations site at investors.micron.com, including audio and slides. In addition, the press release detailing our quarterly results has been posted on the website along with the prepared remarks for this call. Today's discussion of financial results is presented on a non-GAAP financial basis unless otherwise specified. A reconciliation of GAAP to non-GAAP financial measures can be found on our website. We encourage you to visit our website at micron.com throughout the quarter for the most current information on the company including information on financial conferences that we may be attending. You can also follow us on X at Micron Tech. As a reminder, the matters we are discussing today include forward-looking statements regarding market demand and supply, market and pricing trends and drivers, the impact of developing technologies such as AI, product ramp plans, and market position, expected capabilities of our future products, our expected results and guidance, and other matters. These forward-looking statements are subject to risks and uncertainties that may cause actual results to differ materially from statements made today. We refer you to the documents we filed with the SEC, including our Form 10-K, Forms 10-Q, and other reports and filings for a discussion of risks that may affect our future results. Although we believe that the expectations reflected in the forward-looking statements are reasonable, we cannot guarantee future results, levels of activity, performance, or achievements. We are under no duty to update any of the forward-looking statements to conform these statements to actual results. I'll now turn the call over to Sanjay. Thank you, Satya. Good afternoon, everyone. Micron delivered a strong finish to fiscal year 2024 with fiscal Q4 revenue at the high end of our guidance range and gross margins and EPS above the high end of our guidance ranges. In fiscal Q4, we achieved record high revenues in NAND and in our storage business unit. Micron's fiscal 2024 revenue grew over 60%. We expanded company gross margins by over 30 percentage points and achieved revenue records in data center and in automotive. I'm thankful to all our Micron team members for their focus and execution, which made these results possible. We are entering fiscal 2025 with the strongest competitive positioning in Micron's history. We have leadership one beta DRAM and G8 and G9 NAND process technology and leadership products across our end markets. Robust data center demand is exceeding our leading edge node supply and is driving overall healthy supply demand dynamics. As we move through calendar 2025, we expect a broadening of demand drivers, complementing strong demand in the data center. We are making investments to support AI-driven demand, and our manufacturing network is well positioned to execute on these opportunities. We look forward to delivering a substantial revenue record with significantly improved profitability in fiscal 2025, beginning with our guidance for record quarterly revenue in fiscal Q1. Micron is ramping production of the industry's most advanced technology nodes in both DRAM and NAND. Our 1-beta DRAM and G8 and G9 NAND nodes are ramping in high volume and will become an increasing portion of our mix through fiscal 2025. As a reminder, our G8 NAND node refers to our 232-layer NAND technology node. Our 1-gamma DRAM pilot production using extreme ultraviolet lithography is progressing well, and we are on track for volume production in calendar 2025. We delivered fiscal 2024 DRAM front-end cost reductions at the high end 
of the outlook provided at the beginning of the year, and NAND cost reductions were consistent with our forecast. We expect fiscal 2025 DRAM front-end cost reductions, excluding HVM, to be in the mid to high single-digit percentage range. We expect fiscal 2025 NAND cost reductions to be in the low to mid-teens percentage range. We continue to make progress on the construction for our new fab in Idaho and are working with state and federal agencies on the permitting process for our New York site. Construction is underway on our India assembly and test facility, as well as our China Xi'an backend expansion. We are continuously assessing opportunities to manage our manufacturing footprint in a capital efficient manner. Consistent with this strategy, we announced the acquisition of an LCD factory in Taiwan that will be converted to enable DRAM production testing. Micron's proprietary and vertically integrated testing capabilities provide competitive differentiation and enable us to provide high quality products to our customers. Now turning to our end markets. Memory is essential to extend the frontier of AI capability. Multiple vectors will drive AI memory demand over the coming years. Growing model sizes and input token requirements, multi-modality, multi-agent solutions, continuous training, and the proliferation of inference workloads from cloud to the edge. Micron is focused on translating the opportunities from AI demand into value captured for all our stakeholders. Demand from data center customers continues to be strong and customer inventory levels are healthy. Industry server unit shipments are expected to grow in the mid to high single digit percentage range in calendar 2024, driven by strong growth for AI servers, as well as low single digit percentage range growth for traditional servers. We expect traditional server demand to benefit from a refresh cycle as a single latest generation traditional server can replace multiple older generation servers to provide valuable space, power, and performance improvements to improve data center efficiency. We see increasing DRAM and NAND content both in traditional as well as AI servers. Our mix of data center revenue reached a record level in fiscal 2024, and we expect will grow significantly from here in fiscal 2025. Micron is well positioned in the data center with our portfolio of HBM, high capacity D5 and LP5 solutions, and data center SSD products. We expect each of these three product categories to deliver multiple billions of dollars in revenue in fiscal 2025. In HBM, we are making excellent progress on our yield and output capability. In fiscal Q4, we delivered on our expected volumes and achieved our objective of several hundred millions of dollars in revenue from HBM in fiscal year 2024. Even as our DRAM gross margins improved, our, our fiscal Q4 HBM gross margins were accretive to both company and DRAM gross margins, indicative of our solid HBM yield ramp. We expect to achieve HBM market share commensurate with our overall DRAM market share sometime in calendar 2025. We expect the HBM TAM to grow from approximately $4 billion in calendar 2023 to over $25 billion in calendar 2025. As a percent of overall industry DRAM bits, we expect HBM to grow from 1.5% in calendar 2023 to around 6% in calendar 2025. We have a robust roadmap for HBM and are confident we will maintain our time to market, technology, and power efficiency leadership with HBM4 and HBM4E. During the quarter, Micron started shipments of production-capable HBM3E 12-high 36 gigabyte units to key industry partners to enable qualifications across the AI ecosystem. Remarkably, Micron's HBM 3E 12 high 36 gigabyte delivers 20% lower power consumption than our competitor's HBM 3E 
8 high 24 gigabyte solutions while providing 50% higher DRAM capacity. We expect to ramp our HPM 3E 12 high output in early calendar 2025 and increase the 12 high mix in our shipments throughout 2025. As we have said before, our HBM is sold out for calendar 2024 and 2025 with pricing already determined for this time frame. In calendar 2025 and 2026, we will have a more diversified HBM revenue profile as we have won business across a broad range of HBM customers with our industry leading HBM 3E solution. We see strong demand for our high capacity D5 and LP5 solutions. We are seeing increasing adoption of our high capacity mono die based 128 gigabyte D5 DIMM products. We are leveraging our innovative industry leading LP5 solutions to pioneer the adoption of low power DRAM for servers in the data center. Micron's LP5 is specifically designed with data center and AI applications in mind offering unique features for enhanced reliability, availability, and serviceability, or RAF, in a server platform. We are focused on LPDDR design innovation to optimize the capacity, power, and system reliability requirements of AI server infrastructure. Data center SSD demand continues to be driven by strong growth in AI, as well as a recovery in traditional compute and storage. Our strategy to use greater levels of vertical integration, including Micron designed controllers and firmware, has resulted in a data center SSD portfolio that addresses customer requirements for a robust set of features and functionality, competitive total cost of ownership, and industry leading performance and quality. We have gained substantial share in data center SSDs as a result. We achieved a quarterly revenue record with over a billion dollars in revenue in data center SSDs in fiscal Q4, and our fiscal 2024 data center SSD revenues more than tripled from a year ago. Turning to PC, as discussed in our last earnings call, PC customers have built inventories due to the rising memory price trajectory, anticipated growth in AI PCs, as well as an expectation of tight supply caused by an increasing portion of production output being dedicated to meeting the growing data center demand. A sell-through of PCs continues at a steady pace with a seasonal increase in second half of calendar 2024. We expect healthier inventories at PC OEMs by spring 2025. PC unit volumes remain on track to grow in the low single digit range for calendar 2024. We expect unit growth to continue in 2025 and accelerate into the second half of calendar 2025 as, as the PC replacement cycle gathers momentum with the rollout of next gen AI PCs and of support for Windows 10 and the launch of Windows 12. The PC market is in the early stages of a transformation and we expect a significant shift towards AI-driven functionalities that promise to enhance user experiences and productivity. AI PCs require a higher capacity of memory and storage. As an example, leading PC OEMs have recently announced AI-enabled PCs with a minimum of 16 gigabyte of DRAM for the value segment and between 32 to 64 gigabyte for the mid and premium segments versus an average content across all PCs of around 12 gigabyte last year. Micron is well positioned to support the growth of AI PCs with our portfolio of client LP DRAM, DRAM, and SSD products. Our low power compression attached memory module or LP CAM2 product has had multiple design wins at leading PC OEMs. These modules offer all the benefits of low power DRAM in an upgradable form factor compared to the alternative modular D5 based solutions LPCAM2 provides up to 60% lower power and up to 70% better performance along with 60% space savings our 3500 client SSD is qualified 
at all the major PC OEMs and provides the power performance enhancements needed for AI workloads. Turning to mobile, smartphone customer inventory dynamics are evolving in a manner somewhat similar to that of PC customers. Smartphone unit volumes in calendar 2024 are on track to grow in the low to mid single digit percentage range, and we expect unit growth to continue in 2025. Smartphone OEMs are seeking to differentiate their devices by incorporating more AI features such as personalized recommendations, improved camera functionalities, and smarter voice assistants. Recently, leading Android smartphone OEMs have announced AI-enabled smartphones with 12 to 16 gigabyte of DRAM versus an average of 8 gigabyte in flagship phones last year. Micron is well positioned to support the growth of AI smartphones with our leading edge memory and storage products. During the quarter, we extended our product leadership with the first customer qualification of our second generation one beta based LP5X DRAM and second generation of G8 NAND UFS 4.0 products. In the automotive market, infotainment and ADAS are driving long-term memory and storage content growth. For the fourth consecutive year, Micron achieved a fiscal year record for automotive revenue in 2024. Micron has built an industry-leading portfolio of automotive-grade DRAM and NAND products that provide best-in-class solutions for these high-growth applications, leveraging our technology and product leadership, top quality rankings, and close customer collaborations. During the quarter, we achieved qualification of our one beta-based 16 gigabit LP5 with 9.6 gigabit per second speed for the automotive market, which will support the increased performance requirements driven by AI, both in the digital cockpit and ADAS. The automotive industry continues to adjust the mix of EV, hybrid, and traditional vehicles to meet evolving customer demands. As auto customer inventories adjust to this new mix, we expect a resumption in our automotive growth in the second half of fiscal 2025. Now turning to our market outlook. Calendar 2024 DRAM industry demand outlook has improved, driven by strength in data center servers and growth in the other market segments has performed consistent with our prior market commentary. Hence, we have upgraded our expectation for calendar 2024 industry DRAM bit demand growth to now be in the high teens percentage range. Our expectation for calendar 2024 industry NAND bit demand growth remains in the mid teens percentage range. In calendar 2025, we expect both DRAM and NAND industry bit demand growth to be around the mid teens percentage range. Turning to supply, Constructive industry conditions will help drive the considerable improvements in profitability and ROI that are needed to enable the investments required to support future growth. Due to CapEx and supply reduction actions taken across the industry in 2023, we expect industry wafer capacity in both DRAM and NAND in 2024 to be below 2022 peak levels, and for NAND, meaningfully so. This factor, combined with the increasing mix of HBM wafers, is reducing DRAM supply allocated to traditional products and contributing to the healthy industry supply demand environment that we expect for DRAM in calendar 2025. Given the significant reduction in industry wafer capacity in NAND and the ongoing low NAND CapEx environment, we also expect a healthy industry supply demand environment for NAND in calendar 2025. NAND technology transitions generally provide more growth in annualized bits per wafer compared to the NAND bid demand CAGR expectation of high teens. Consequently, we anticipate longer periods between industry technology transitions and moderating capital investment over time to align industry supply with demand. This can reduce both R&D expense growth 
and capital intensity in NAND over time, which can contribute to the improved financial health of the NAND industry. Micron invested $8.1 billion in CapEx in fiscal 2024. We expect fiscal 2025 CapEx to be meaningfully higher and at around mid-30s percentage range of revenue based on our current CapEx and revenue expectations. The growth in both Greenfield Fab Construction and HBM CapEx investments is projected to make up the overwhelming majority of the year-over-year -year CapEx increase. As a reminder, our investments in facility and construction in Idaho and New York will support our long-term demand outlook for DRAM and will not contribute to bid supply in fiscal 2025 and 2026. Micron will continue to exercise supply and CapEx discipline and focus on improving profitability, including walking away from less profitable business while still maintaining our overall bit market share for DRAM and NAND. I will now turn it over to Mark for our financial results and outlook. Thank you, Sanjay, and good afternoon, everyone. In fiscal Q4, Micron delivered revenue at the high end of the guidance range and gross margin and EPS above the high end of the guidance ranges. We are exiting the fiscal year with excellent momentum, having expanded our industry-leading product portfolio, executed well on pricing, and improved our financial performance significantly from the start of the year. Total fiscal Q4 revenue is approximately $7.8 billion, up 14% sequentially and up 93% year over year. Fiscal 2024 total revenue was $25.1 billion, up 62% year over year. Fiscal Q4 DRAM revenue was $5.3 billion, up 93% year over year, and represented 69% of total revenue. Sequentially, DRAM revenue increased 14%, with flattish bit shipments and prices increasing in the mid-teens percentage range. For the fiscal year, DRAM revenue increased 60% year-over-year to $17.6 billion, representing 70% of total revenue. Fiscal Q4 NAND revenue was $2.4 billion, up 96% year-over-year, and represented 31% of Micron's total revenue. NAND revenue increased 15% sequentially, with bit shipments increasing in the high single-digit percentage range and prices increasing in the high single-digit percentage range. Fiscal Q4 NAND revenue was a new quarterly record for Micron. For the fiscal year, NAND revenue increased 72% year-over-year to $7.2 billion representing 29% of total revenue. Now turning to revenue by business unit. Compute and networking business unit revenue was $3 billion, up 17% sequentially. Data center server DRAM achieved a quarterly revenue record in fiscal Q4, driven by strong demand for high-capacity solutions, as well as our continued ramp of HBM. Revenue for the mobile business unit was $1.9 billion, up 18% sequentially, driven by seasonal product ramps. Revenue for the storage business unit was $1.7 billion, up 24% sequentially, and led by data center SSD, which reached a quarterly revenue record. We achieved record high revenue for fiscal year 2024 for our NAND storage business. Embedded business unit revenue was $1.2 billion, down 9% sequentially. In fiscal 2024, the automotive segment achieved a new fiscal year revenue record for the fourth consecutive year. The consolidated gross margin for fiscal Q4 was 36.5%, improving over 8 percentage points sequentially. Higher pricing and improved product mix were the key drivers of the stronger profitability. For the fiscal year, consolidated gross margin was 23.7%, up over 31 percentage points year-over-year. 
operating expenses in fiscal Q4 were $1 billion, $81 million, up $105 million sequentially due to an increase in R&D program expenses. For the fiscal year, operating expenses were $4 billion, up 11% year over year. The increase in fiscal 2024 operating expenses was primarily driven by an increase in R&D investments and reinstatement of short-term incentive compensation. We generated operating income of $1.7 billion in fiscal Q4, resulting in an operating margin of approximately 23%, which was up 9 percentage points sequentially and up 53 percentage points from a year ago quarter. Fiscal 2024 operating income was $1.9 billion, resulting in an operating margin of approximately 8%, which was up 39 percentage points year over year. Fiscal Q4 adjusted EBITDA was $3.7 billion, resulting in an EBITDA margin of 48%, up 5 percentage points sequentially and up 30 percentage points from the year-ago quarter. Fiscal 2024 EBITDA was $9.7 billion, resulting in an EBITDA margin of over 38%, which was up 20 percentage points year over year. Fiscal Q4 taxes were $387 million and higher than our guide, largely due to a shift in the jurisdictional mix of earnings. Fiscal 2024 taxes were $379 million, or approximately 20% of pre-tax income. Non-GAAP diluted earnings per share in fiscal Q4 was $1.18, compared to $0.62 cents per share in the prior quarter and a loss per share of $1.07 in the year-ago quarter. Fiscal Q4 non-GAAP EPS exceeded the high end of our guidance range, driven by better pricing and profitability. Fiscal 2024 non-GAAP EPS was $1.30. Turning to cash flows and capital spending, our operating cash flows were $3.4 billion in fiscal Q4, representing 44% of revenue. For the fiscal year, we generated $8.5 billion of operating cash flows, representing 34% of revenue. Capital expenditures were $3.1 billion during the quarter. CapEx totaled $8.1 billion for the fiscal year, up from $7 billion in fiscal 2023. We generated $323 million of free cash flow for the quarter and $386 million for the fiscal year. As announced in early August, we determined that share repurchases may resume in light of improved conditions. As such, with our return to free cash flow, reduced leverage, and long-term positive outlook, we saw an opportunity to repurchase shares in the quarter. In fiscal Q4, we repurchased $300 million or 3.2 million shares at an average price of $93.07 per share. Micron's fiscal Q4 ending inventory was $8.9 billion, or 158 days, up three days from the prior quarter. Micron continues to exercise pricing discipline and expect a healthy supply-demand environment in the industry in fiscal 2025. We intend to draw down our inventory to support our revenue growth in fiscal 2025. On the balance sheet, we held $9.2 billion of cash and investments at quarter end and maintained near $11.7 billion of liquidity when including our untapped credit facility. We ended the quarter with $13.4 billion in total debt, low net leverage, and a weighted average maturity on our debt of 2031. We are committed to further strengthening our balance sheet and sustaining our investment grade credit rating. Now turning to our outlook for the fiscal first quarter. 
Fiscal Q1 gross margin is projected to improve sequentially, primarily on better pricing and portfolio mix. Recall that in fiscal Q4, HBM remained accretive to both DRAM and overall company gross margins. We project changes in our portfolio mix to continue to be an important and favorable contributor to gross margins over time. We forecast operating expenses to be flat to slightly up in the fiscal first quarter compared to fiscal fourth quarter levels. For the full fiscal year 2025, we see operating expenses growing by a mid-teens percentage versus fiscal 2024. Growth in operating expenses is planned to be second half weighted as we ramp necessary R&D program investments, including for HBM, to capture the substantial growth opportunity ahead. For fiscal Q1 and fiscal 2025, we estimate our non-GAAP tax rate to be in the mid-teens percent range. We project days of inventory outstanding to decline in fiscal 2025 and for DIO to approach our target by the end of fiscal 2025. In fiscal Q1, we forecast capital expenditures to increase sequentially to approximately $3.5 billion. As Sanjay mentioned, we expect fiscal 2025 CapEx to be around mid-30s percentage range of revenue based on our current CapEx and revenue expectations. We remain circumspect with all capital spending and disciplined with WFE investments in order to grow spit supply in line with industry demand. With all these factors in mind, our non-GAAP guidance for fiscal Q1 is as follows. We expect revenue to be $8.7 billion, plus or minus $200 million. Gross margin to be in the range of 39.5%, plus or minus 100 basis points. And operating expenses to be approximately $1 billion, $85 million, plus or minus $15 million. As mentioned, we expect the fiscal Q1 tax rate to be in the mid-teens percent range. Based on a share count of approximately 1.14 billion shares, we expect EPS to be $1.74 per share, plus or minus eight cents. In closing, we remain focused on investing in a disciplined manner to support our growth and maintain stable bit share in DRAM and NAND. Micron is well positioned to deliver record revenue as well as significantly improve profitability and free cash flow in fiscal 2025. I will now turn it back over to Sanjay. Thank you, Mark. Fiscal 2024 was a year of many records as we discussed earlier, and I expect fiscal 2025 to be even better. With the advent of AI, we are in the most exciting period that I have seen for memory and storage in my career. Micron's memory and storage innovations are enabling tremendous breakthroughs, transforming how the world uses information to enrich life for all. Micron has sustained multiple generations of technology leadership in DRAM and NAND. Our unique culture and our industry-leading product portfolio, combined with our world-class manufacturing execution and quality, are enabling us to deliver differentiated, high-value solutions across end markets. This has made us the partner of choice for our customers as they plan their long-term roadmaps and our momentum lays the foundation for an exciting fiscal 2025. Thank you for joining us today. We will now open for questions. Certainly, thank you. And our first question comes from the line of Timothy Curry from UBS. Your question, please. Thanks a lot. Um, Mark, I guess my first question is um, some of the assumptions and guidance. I think you've been saying kind of on the conference circuit that bits would be pretty flat um, in uh, fiscal Q1 for both DRAM and NAND. Is that what you're still assuming so that most of the increase in, uh, in the you know, revenue is basically pricing? Is that correct? Yeah, uh, Tim, um, what we see now, um, and we um, 
had provided a slight update um, in August, but um, we now see that um, DRAM bits we expect to be um, up uh, somewhat higher than what we had said before. We had said before they were going to be flat, and we revised that to flat to slightly up. And in this latest guide, we now view um, DRAM to be um, up somewhat higher from that. Um, NAND bits we expect to be um, sequentially um, flattish. Um, you know, keep in mind that our guide, you know, also contemplates um, you know a healthy supply demand environment um, and an increasingly favorable mix in the business with HBM high capacity DIMMs, LP, uh, data center SSD. So we see um, stronger data center demand, um, and we had indicated that it was robust, and that's been favorable. And then um, we're just executing well on you know, our product roadmaps, our product execution, um, our overall manufacturing um, execution. Thanks, Mark. And then just one last thing. Um, you had said that HBM revenue last quarter in May was a little over $100 million. Can you give us the number in August? It, was, it, it looks like it was 300, three to 350, something like that. Is that about right for your HBM revenue in fiscal Q4? So we are not uh, disclosing a specific revenue for FQ4. Uh, we had said earlier that we'll have several hundred million dollars of revenue in uh, fiscal year 24, and we achieved that objective and really uh, very proud of all the execution from our team in terms of putting in place the capacity, managing the yield ramp successfully to our goals and of course uh, continue to deliver a strong product uh, to our uh, customer base. So uh, not providing, we're not going to be providing specifics on a quarter by quarter basis, uh, but keep in mind, yes, we delivered several hundred million dollars of revenue in fiscal year 24. And we look forward to delivering multiple billions of dollars of revenue of HBM in fiscal year 25. Okay. Thank you, Sanjay. Thank you. And our next question comes from the line of CJ Muse from Cantor Fitzgerald. Your question, please. Yeah, good afternoon. Thank you for taking the question. I, I guess first question on gross margins, you guided up a robust 300 basis points. was hoping you could spend a little bit of time kind of walking us through, um, you know, what's driving that. How, how much is from like to like DRAM, um, ASP increases, mix, HBM yield improvements, and, and cost downs? And, and I guess as you kind of walk through that, can you give us a flavor of, of how to think about those drivers beyond the November quarter? So, CJ, um, you know, in the, in the fourth to first quarter, um, you know, as as we as we look at that margin expansion, it's it's um, you know it's similar to the themes we've talked about before. Uh, the supply and, and supply demand environment is healthy, so we're seeing um, that play through um, on on uh, you know in in pricing. Um, we're also seeing um, you know the execution of our product roadmap and the ramp of the higher value products. Um, and that's contributing. Um, on costs, um, we are doing well on cost downs. Um, you know, um, however, in the first quarter, because of the mix with HBM, we are going to see uh, DRAM um, um, uh, costs go up slightly. Um, and um, you know, and that's uh, you know. So as we as we look forward um, into the end of the first quarter, um, you know, things are coming together as as we had hoped. Um, you know, tight at the leading edge, good supply demand, um, you know, favorable pricing environment, um, and uh, certainly favorable mix, and that becoming a more important part of the business, and good cost execution. Very helpful. And, and then I guess maybe as a follow-up, um, you've reiterated your, your CapEx outlook, but obviously the end market environment has changed a bit in the last three months, so curious if you've changed your prioritization of CapEx uh, at all. Obviously, you talked about a focus on shelves in HBM. Any other change um, in terms of your spending? Not really. We don't have any other change. I mean, um, again, you know, continuing to focus our CapEx on HBM investment, uh, you know, which, as you know, is a high-value solution, and 
product uh, tends to be accretive to the margins, and of course, long-term uh, construction uh, capex, and that is um, we have construction capex that is targeted for longer-term bid growth for the second latter part of this decade. Thank you. Thank you. And our next question comes from the line of Chris Shankar from TD Cowan. Your question, please. Yeah, I have two questions. One, Sanjay, um, you know, your AI GPU customers are moving to a one-year cadence for their products, and it looks like the HBM roadmap is also moving to that 12-month from a prior 18-month cadence. Um, do you think that this puts you and your peers at a yield disadvantage, i.e., in other words, as HBM 3E yield and gross margin improves, you have to migrate to HBM 4, and that new node might come at a lower yield. So I'm just kind of curious how to think about that cadence of HBM progression and how that impacts yield and gross margin. And then I had a quick follow-up. As we mentioned, we are doing well with respect to our goals on HBM uh, 3E yields with 8 high. And in 25, of course, uh, we will be um, you know, beginning our output in early 2025 with 12 high, and of course 12 high will be going through its own yield ramp, and 12 high will be ramping through our calendar year 25. And HBM4 will be a 2026 product, and like any other new product, of course, uh, there are, um, you know, in the early stages, always a ramp up of yield involved. But we are very pleased with the technical expertise that we have, manufacturing expertise, and doing really uh, quite well uh, in terms of uh, uh, continuing to ramp up the yield and the quality of our products. And, you know, at the end of the day, you know that cadence of, uh, you know, our customers' cadence moving faster uh, only benefits those who have the best product and technology because they are the ones who are able to work with the customers uh, at the pace that they need. And we are... With our HBM 3E, which has demonstrated clear leadership in performance, in um, power, um, and uh, you know overall uh, you know product um, uh, feature set for our customers, we absolutely plan to maintain that leadership going forward with our roadmap from uh, 8 high to 12 high of HBM 3E and HBM 4 and 4E in the future years. Um, along with our uh, expertise in manufacturing, that should play to our strength in the time frame ahead. And we work very closely with our helpful. customers. We work very, very closely with our customers, you know, to understand their cadence, to understand their requirements, and make sure that our roadmap, uh, both from technology, product, and manufacturing capabilities, is aligned well with their requirements. Got it. Thank, thanks a lot for that, Sanjay. Super helpful color. And a quick follow-up for Mark on inventory. Um, I understand you're going to draw that down in FY25, but just in the last quarter it went up. Any color on where that inventory level is going up? Is that within PCs? Is it mobile DRAM? Any color that would be helpful? Thanks, Mark. Sure. We were clear about this in, in, in the August conferences that we were seeing, while we were seeing robust data center demand, um, we were seeing uh, some customers had, uh, you know, were buying ahead um, anticipation of price increases, um, you know, the rollout of AI-related devices, um, and, and just surety of supply, given that uh, leading edge is, is tight. So, um, you know, we did see some inventory build, and we communicated that inventories would remain elevated uh, going into FY25, so is what you see. So our days did go up. Um, you know, we continue to be um, prudent with our supply and walking away from less profitable business. Um, we do expect, um, you know, the environment, supply-demand environment, to be constructive for improved profitability in 25. Um, and uh, given the tight uh, leading edge nodes and our outlook, uh, we're going to need these inventories to bridge us to when our um, production on tech node transitions ramps. Um, so that's why we've given an outlook that, you know, our inventories by the end of the fiscal year, we expect to be approaching our target inventory levels. Now, our, our volumes happen to be a bit more second half weighted of the fiscal year. 
So we'll see a bit shallower improvement at the you know, first half of the fiscal year, and then that improvement in DIO will steepen um, as we move, move through the second half. But we're, we're confident in our, in our inventory outlook and definitely need these leading edge inventories to supply the market. Thanks, Mark. Thank you. And our next question comes from the line of Joseph Moore from Morgan Stanley. Your question, please. Great, thank you. In terms of your target for getting to HBM market share that's more in line with your overall market share, can you kind of characterize how you get there? Do you anticipate that it's still a supply constrained environment for everybody, or are we sort of more a little bit more balanced and the quality of the micron product drives us through? Just what's the determinant of that market share that gets you to that level? Well, certainly, I mean, we are being responsible and disciplined in terms of managing our market share. We have um, you know, industry's best HBM 3E product, and uh, it's the best product with uh, you know 30% lower power with 8 high, and and um, you know, and in fact, when you go to 12 high, we are 20% lower power, uh, despite 50% increase in capacity versus uh, in others uh, 8 high products. So we are well positioned with our product, with its performance, with its power, and that's what is really putting us in the strong position of, um, you know, being a product being sold out for our 24 and 25 time frame. And when we look at HBM, we have talked about that next year we project a TAM of $25 billion, consuming, consuming about 6%, over 6% of the industry best. In fact, a TAM of greater than $25 billion in 2025. And we are pretty confident that with our uh, product, with our yield ramp, um, and with the agreements that we have in place with our customers, uh, we will uh, deliver sometime uh, in 2025, get to our share to be in line with our industry share. So, of course, uh, it's limited at this point by our production ramp. Um, and but we are really on a very good trajectory there. So we feel very confident uh, with our product and with our production ramp and with share opportunities. And frankly, our HBM 3E product is getting premium in the industry as well versus other products. So it just puts us on a good trajectory ahead as well. Great, thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. And our next question comes from the line of Vivek Arya from Bank of America Securities. Your question, please. Uh, thanks for taking my questions. I had uh, two as well. Um, Sanjay, on that same topic of HPM, there is some concern about the potential for HPM oversupply in, in 25. Let's say if there are three suppliers instead of the two that are um, right now. Is that something you see um, that there is any potential for oversupply? And let's say if you take the other scenario where there continue to be only two suppliers of next-gen HBM, do you think the third supplier could flood the market uh, with additional, um, you know, DRAM, uh, just sort of the reverse of this trade ratio uh, argument? So just curious to hear how you think about the supply-demand dynamics for both uh, traditional DRAM and HBM for next year. So we certainly assume that the third supplier will ultimately succeed in having HBM 3E product as well and will have some share in the marketplace as well. And, I, you know, again, as I pointed out earlier, um, with the solid product that we have, uh, we, our product is sold out through 2025 uh, time frame, and we are really uh, well positioned with this product. I think the part that you have to keep in mind is that leading edge supply, as we have mentioned here, is tight. Leading edge supply is tight because industry uh, in 22-23 time frame uh, with uh, you know, reductions in CapEx and cap, CapEx efficient industry, industry wide transitions uh, to the newer technology nodes. The wafer capacity uh, has come down from the peak levels uh, in meaningful ways. So, the, the lower wafer capacity compared to the peak of 2022, as well as the HBM uh, 3 to 1 trade ratio, these are the ones that are overall keeping the industry in a tight supply, and tight supply not just for HPM, uh, but also for non-HPM part of the market. So we, of course, uh, feel very good about our own plans with HPM, 
And of course, we always, uh, you know, stay completely focused on managing the mix of our business between non-HBM and HBM, and remaining extremely disciplined about CapEx, about our share objectives. We have shared those share objectives about HBM here. Um, overall, we have said we maintain our DRAM uh, as well as NAND uh, supply share uh, to be stable. And you know, this is how we look at the overall market. But when you look at the market trends, it's not just about demand trend on HPM, which is, of course, growing substantially, becoming more than $25 billion market in 2025. It's also about, um, you know, past spring, we see that our demand for uh, memory in smartphones and PCs as AI-enabled smartphones become bigger and bigger part of um, uh, the market, you know, in the quarters and the years to come. And, um, of course, uh, customer inventories by spring time frame in smartphone and PCs for memory get to earlier levels. Uh, we see that to be a driver of demand as well to complement the strong data center demand. And we are looking at, you know, strong momentum, not just with HBM. We have talked about uh, multiple billions of dollars of uh, revenue that we uh, target to generate in our fiscal year 2025. Uh, from uh, high capacity um, DRAM modules uh, as, as well as LP memory in data center. Um, so th these are all the elements that point to strong demand trends and the demand trends driven by AI in data center as well as in smartphone and PCs where more and more content is required in an environment where the leading edge supply is today tight. So I think the opportunity uh, is tremendous and we see healthy demand supply balance and a constructive environment for our financial performance in fiscal 2025. And that's why we say with confidence that we'll deliver a substantial revenue record in fiscal year 2025 uh, with significant improvement in our profitability as well. Very helpful. And maybe quick uh, follow-up for Mark. Mark, on the Q3 call, I think you were a little more explicit about both uh, industry pricing and, and your gross margins expanding through fiscal uh, 25. Is that still a useful construct from where you see, uh, from what you see today? Or, or do you think there is a scenario where gross margins or your pricing start to flatten out or, or even go in the other direction through fiscal 25? What, what is the operating assumption for fiscal 25 as you see it right now? Thank you. Uh, maybe just following up here to you know, draw on Sanjay's comments. I mean, we see a very positive setup in fiscal 25, um, and so have said substantial revenue record, significantly improved profitability. The supply-demand setup is quite good. Uh, the market's uh, leading edge is very tight. Um, as we've talked about, the industry wafer capacity has come down. Um, and so, um, you know, and HBM, of course, has, has um you know, uh, creating supply constraints uh, in the marketplace as that as those bit share bits increase. Um, so, uh, you know, we still see that um, the supply and the band environment is healthy through the year. Um, we also are constructive for the year. We also see um, the trend we've talked about that our volume is increasingly moving to. Um, support um, higher value um, ad products with our differentiated portfolio, so HBM, high capacity DIMMs, more LP, um, and then our um, NAND SSD um, uh, you know, for data center portfolio products. Um, so I, I think the you know the the margin expansion uh, through the year, supported by those elements and continued good cost performance. Um, gives us confidence on on uh, on a on a very good year. Thank you. Thank you. And our next question comes from the line of Tashihari from Goldman Sachs. Your question, please. Thank you. Um, I had a two-part question on the HBM business. Um, Sanjay, you talked about uh, you all being sold out through Calendar 25. I'm curious if there's an opportunity for Micron to present upside or deliver upside to what the plan is currently for 25, or are equipment lead times such that 
you're essentially capped vis-a-vis uh, -vis what your expectations are today uh, for HBM specifically. And then my second part is on gross margin for HBM. Um, we all understand that the business is accretive to both the corporate average and, and also relative to DRAM. As you look forward into calendar 25, with volumes locked in and pricing locked in, I would assume you've got decent visibility on gross margins. Should we expect HBM gross margins to stay kind of where, where they are, or could they move further up um, as, as long as you execute on, on the yield side? Thanks. So regarding the, your, part of your question on the upside for HBM in 2025, um, so again, uh, let me emphasize that we are extremely focused on delivering our goals of getting to our share um, in HBM to be in line with DRAM share sometime in 2025, extremely focused on continuing to ramp up our production capacity and yield ramp, which are going well according to our plan. I'm very pleased with that. Uh, so remaining focused on that, and of course, if there are opportunities to be opportunistic, uh, with any upsides, of course, we will be uh, capturing those. And, you know, those upsides always remain in yields. We expect to get to mature yields on our HPM in uh, fiscal year 25. Um, yields are always an upside opportunity. Productivity of the equipment always can be an opportunity as well. So we'll, we'll manage our business responsibly uh, and with total focus on uh, delivering to our goals and um, and maintaining our focus on keeping our HBM, um, you know, commitments to our customers uh, coming through successfully. Now, regarding your questions on gross margin being uh, accretive, uh, yes, we would expect our HBM business to be accretive uh, for our fiscal year 2025. We, beyond that, really not providing any further details. And yes, you are right that our volume and pricing for HBM um, is uh, logged up for 2024 as well as for 2025 timeframe, calendar year 2024 and calendar year 2025. Great. Um, and then as a quick follow-up on DRAM industry bit growth, uh, I think you raised your 24 outlook to high teens, uh, and you gave a preliminary 25 outlook of, of mid-teens. I'm curious what's driving the, the D cell from 24 to 25. Uh, is the 25 number a supply constraint number? Um, from a demand perspective, Sanjay, you sounded you know pretty constructive on on PCs and smartphones, and obviously the content opportunity, um, and you remain pretty positive on data centers. So I'm I'm just curious what's driving the the expected D cell in 25. Thank you. Yeah, we'll just point. I mean, by the way, we have um, uh, in the past talked about DRAM Kagger being mid teens. At 2024, uh, we have increased the outlook to high teens based on the strength in the data center, um, and uh, 2025, as we look at it, just keep in fact mind two factors. One is we are now comparing it to the higher base of 2024, which has gone to high teens. Um, so you know that, of course, impacts the percentage of the 25. And second piece is that, as we had noted, that smartphone and um, uh, PCs, which at the end market level are continuing to do fine, uh, but g given for the three factors that we have mentioned in our earnings call script that the customers built some inventory, uh, the sell-in is somewhat less than their sell-out uh, in terms of memory. Uh, and we have said that uh, by spring of 2025, we expect in PCs uh, customer inventory levels to get to uh, healthier levels versus now, and these will continue to improve. So that too plays a factor. And of course, uh, I will just like to remind you that we have pointed out that um, uh, overall smartphone and PC uh, unit growth will be occurring in 2025. And of course, increasing penetration of AI phones and second half, that acceleration, uh, that growth will be obviously stronger than the first half. Uh, so all of these factors are fa uh, you know, included in our current outlook of 2025 DRAM growth being in mid-teens. Uh, and let me just point out that, um, you know, previously we had said that HBM, uh, we would expect it to be greater than $20 billion opportunity in 2025. We have now said HBM is more than $25 billion opportunity 
2025. So as you know, HBM has a trade ratio of three to one. It takes three times as many wafers to produce the same bits as standard products, the technology nodes. So obviously, uh, you know, the growth of HBM um, also impacts the, the, the total bit growth uh, year over year in aggregate. Thank you. Thank you, and this does conclude the question and answer session, as well as today's program. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for your participation. You may now disconnect. Good day. Hi, and welcome to Micron's post-earnings analyst call. At this time, all participants are in listen-only mode. After the speaker's presentation, there will be a question and answer session. To ask a question during this session, you'll need to press star 11 on your telephone. If your question has been answered and you'd like to remove yourself from the queue, simply press star 11 again. As a reminder, today's program is being recorded. And now I'd like to introduce your host for today's program, Satya Kumar, Investor Relations. Please go ahead, sir. Yeah, thanks, Jonathan. And thank you and welcome to Micron Technologies' Fiscal Fourth Quarter 2024 Post-Earnings Analyst Call. On the call with me today are Sumit Sadana, Micron's Chief Business Officer, Manish Bhatia, EVP of Global Operations, and Mark Murphy, our CFO. As a reminder, the matters we're discussing today include forward-looking statements regarding market demand and supply, market trends and drivers, and our expected results and guidance in other matters. These forward-looking statements are subject to risks and uncertainties that may cause actual results to differ materially from statements made today. We refer you to documents that we have filed with the SEC, including our most recent Form 10-Q and upcoming Form 10-Q for a 10-K for a discussion of risks that may affect our results. Although we believe that the expectations reflected in the forward-looking statements are reasonable, we cannot guarantee future results, levels of activity, performance, and achievements. We are under no duty to update any of the forward-looking statements to conform these statements to actual results. We can now open the call up to Q&A. Certainly. And our first question comes from the line of Carl Ackerman from BMP. Your question, please. Yes, thank you. Um, two questions, if I may. Uh, first, from a demand perspective, you indicated that server will continue to become a growing area of revenue growth as PC and smartphone demand remains mixed near term. I was curious if you could discuss your assumptions for server unit growth in fiscal 25. Uh, and as you address that question, is your high capacity DRAM DIMMs, such as 128 gigabyte, uh, only used in AI servers, or is it balanced across traditional servers that you've indicated are going through a product cycle refresh? Yeah, in terms of um, call, in terms of the server mix, uh, we do expect that um, the traditional servers will continue to improve in terms of the tone of the demand uh, and will grow uh, because the applications that um, and the software that uh, IT uh, departments across large companies have been running. Um, that software deployment continues. You can see the growth in the application software industry. So um, general purpose server growth can be compressed only so much, uh, has been compressed quite a bit over the last couple of years. So we do expect this year there will be um, some modest um, unit growth in general purpose servers and it will continue into next year and then, of course, the growth in AI servers is expected to be strong um, this year, strong next year. Uh, we don't see um, any kind of um, change in that expectation that we have provided uh, over the last uh, couple of quarters. Uh, for 2025, definitely that momentum in AI continues. And, um, of course, uh, we have a lot of um, improvement in our competitive positioning in the server arena. We have spoken extensively about that. Um, we have HBM growth in AI servers. Uh, of course, we have high cap DIMMs that you mentioned. These 128 gigabyte DIMMs do get used in both uh, AI servers as well as uh, traditional servers, but predominantly, uh, their use is in AI servers because they are more expensive on a per-bit basis than 64-gigabyte DIMMs. 
consequently, uh, they tend to get used more in uh, AI servers, both on the training as well as inferencing side, uh, and we expect that to continue. Thank you. I appreciate that. If I could sneak in one more, <clears throat> uh, I would just <clears throat> hoping you could clarify your comments on inventory. Uh, you know, we, obviously, inventory rose three hundred million dollars as you maintain discipline around um, supply. Um, are you suggesting that fiscal Q4 remains the peak dollar value of inventory as PC and smartphone demand begins to improve in the first half of the year? Thank you. Yeah, Carl, it's Mark. Um, you know, we don't typically give dollar estimates because clearly what, you know, what happens with our forecast were, you know, yeah, you know, modulating builds and uh, you know uh, building. You know, we have raw materials and whip and so forth. Um, you know, our so we we tend to focus on providing you a, a DIO number. Um, uh, we did think that on a dollar and DIO basis, it would be elevated going into 25. Um, and what we will see, uh, we believe. Um, is uh, inventory uh, days improving through 25. Um, and, um, you know, particularly in the second half of our fiscal year, as our fiscal year is more second half weighted on volumes. Now, of course, the business is getting larger, so on a dollar basis, you know, there won't be the same degree of change, but on the, on the DIO, um, we do see um, improvement through the year um, particularly in the back half of the year. Thank you. Thank you. And our next question comes from the line of Harlan Sir from JP Morgan. Your question, please. Yeah, hey, good afternoon, and um, congrats on the uh, strong overall operational execution. You know, on the better DRAM bit shipment outlook in November up sequentially versus prior view of flat to up slightly, how much of that is better than expected yield improvements in HBM, right? Because we know your AI customers are supply constrained on HBM 3E. So any better yield and resulting supply unlock would be consumed right away, right? So as part of the better bit shipment outlook this quarter due to better HBM supply unlock versus your prior expectations? Uh -huh. Maybe I'll answer Harlan just on the HPM ramp, and then some of you can answer on some of the other drivers on, um, you know, of the of the guidance for DRAM. But you know, our yield ramp is, uh, you know, is continuing to be strong. We feel good about where we are with our yields on on HPM. We were able to achieve our goal for fiscal Q4, and our mm -hmm. in terms of shipping several hundred million dollars worth of revenue. And we said that these were, you know, both quarters, FQ3 and FQ4, were at gross margins that were above our, um, you know, our, uh, you know, the rest of the DRAM uh, product. So, you know, we feel like we've executed well on this ramp, and we continue to look forward to being able to uh, support this multi-billion dollar business opportunity for us in fiscal year 25. So, um, you know, we feel good about where we are with HBM, and, uh, uh, and I'll let Summit talk about some of the other demand drivers of the, the, the strength in since our, our last public comments at some conferences earlier this uh, year. Yeah, thanks, Manish. So in terms of demand, definitely the um, strength in the data center is driving upside to uh, what we had prior communicated on the FQ1 trajectory on DRAM shipments. Um, and we continue to see uh, really strong demand from the data center. Um, the demand is coming from both the um, cloud uh, and enterprise uh, AI servers as well as uh, traditional server uh, origin. Okay, perfect. And then maybe just to follow up, you know, there, there's been so much noise in the market around excess supply for more lagging edge DDR4 DRAM. I mean, you know, the Micron team is a part of your CapEx capacity optimization initiatives over the past 12 months has really been focused right on converting lagging edge capacity to leading edge capacity. On top of that, the team has been focused on sort of more value-added solutions, right? So I assume that all of this is translated to 
less DDR4 output as well, but can you guys just level set us? Like what percentage of your DRAM bit shipments are DDR4 today? And where do you expect that mix to be exiting this calendar year? Yeah, so uh, we don't provide percent of bits that are DDR4 or 5, but I can just provide some color that uh, DDR4 shipments continue to fall as a percent of our overall uh, DRAM bit shipments uh, over the uh, last year, and looking ahead will again fall uh, into next year because more and more of our mix is shifting towards uh, DDR5 over time. Uh, it's shifting mm -hmm. towards LP5 that we are uh, now shipping to the data center. We had mentioned that Micron is a pioneer in the use of low power DRAM in the data center. So LP5 in the data center itself is going to become a very significant product category for us. And we are leadership in the industry. Uh, it's a very uh, important product opportunity for us. So when we drive more of the shipments there as well. It further reduces the mix of uh, DDR4 and LP4 as part of the overall number. And then, of course, we have mentioned to you multiple times about HBM mix increasing every quarter yes. um, and mm -hmm. getting to uh, fairly high levels of our mix. Um, and when we think about the uh, overall um, bit mix of HBM and then the over three to one trade ratio on the wafer mix. You can imagine that, you know, that also um, constrains the overall mix of um, the wafers that are going towards DDR4 and uh, other lagging uh, technology products. And no, in our just, yeah. And just to your question on, you know, the, the transitions and what we've been doing, um, you know, what we've talked about, you know, I think have mentioned, um, you know, uh, in the past that our one beta node is actually optimized for DDR5 and LP5. Yes. Also has HBM on it as well. So as we've been converting to one beta, and we said even in the prepared remarks that, um, you know, we're continuing to, add, you know, increase our, our mix of one beta as we move forward here in fiscal 25. So. You can kind of see that that is a uh, you know supportive of the comments Summit made in terms of you know those high value applications DDR5 yeah. LP5 HBM you know and our, our you know moving you know growing in um, our our supply capability to serve those markets. Yeah, appreciate the color. Thank you. Yeah, and I would Harlan maybe just to add uh, you know our our inventory values most of that is leading edge. So as defined, as we've defined it, so um, you know that um, through the year, uh, you know, we need that inventory to mm -hmm. um, help with that transition that Manish mentioned um, as we bridge to um, increasing one beta capacity. I no, appreciate that. Thank you, guys. Thank you. And our next question comes from the line of Aaron Rickers from Wells Fargo. Your question, please. Yeah, thank you uh, for taking the question. Uh, d just building on the, the prior, you know, question from Harlan, uh, you know, we, we've talked a lot about, you know, the industry about the, the trade ratio, the three to one. A as you guys move to the 12 high stack and you, you talk about the confidence moving towards HBM4 and 4E, I I'm curious of how you see the evolution of that trade ratio. Do you think it actually, does it ever go down because yields improve, or, or is there a propensity to see that maybe even increase uh, as we think about HBM4 and beyond? I'm curious as to how, how, you're, how that's evolved, how you've thought about that, and I have a quick follow-up as well. Sure, sure Aaron. Um, so, you know, we, we have talked about how, you know, HBM uh, 3E, you know, will have a three-to-one trade ratio, and that, um, you, know, I, that uh, you know, that is made up of, uh, Primarily factors of the the die size growth, um, you know, HBM die size is larger than standard products in the same node. In order to be able to provide the the high bandwidth capability and performance capability that uh, you know that HBM um, that that you know defines HBM, uh, and we have uh, you know and, and also based on the the yields in the you know throughout the process and and in particular the assembly process. So you can assume that the 12 high will have uh, maybe a slightly higher 
trade ratio than 8 high. And we've said also that as we move towards HBM4, we see that trade ratio um, increase as well. Um, you know, we haven't really commented beyond that, but you can kind of imagine that as the, the performance gap between um, the HBM standard at the time and the, the standard products of LP and DDR, as the performance gap between those widens, then, you know, that's what's the biggest driver in terms of the, the trade ratio because the, uh, more and more of the die size is dedicated to providing high bandwidth uh, capability on the die that's differentiated in, in HBM versus standard DDR and LP products. Yep, that, that's very helpful. And then it's just a quick follow-up. I know you've given some framework around CapEx and the guidance for the, the, the first fiscal quarter. I'm just curious, you know, Mark, as, as we think about, you know, the CapEx trajectory, is there, is there things with, you know, as you look forward that, that make CapEx more, you know, back half-weighted relative to past years? Uh, any kind of trajectory of how you're thinking about the CapEx spend, you know, relative to what we've seen the last few years as far as the cadence uh, through the fiscal year? No, Aaron. At this at this time, um, you know, we've we've given um, you know um, quite a bit on capex for this fiscal year 25. Um, we indicate that would be up meaningfully. Um, we, um, you know, we 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 gave uh, you know 3.5 billion for the first quarter. Uh, we've given that um, you know we we've given that we expect full year estimate of mid 30s percent of revenue. So we'll we'll. You know, we'll provide more through the year. Um, you know, we can provide a bit more color on, you know, the, the nature of that CapEx. I mean, the overwhelming majority in 25 is a support HBM. Um, CapEx as well as facility, construction, back end, and, and R&D. Um, you know, WFE was down in, in uh, you know, both 22 to 23, then down again in 24. Uh, uh, or down from 22 to 23, then down again in 24. Um, we do expect WFE to be up up a bit, um, increase in 25. Uh, but we'll remain disciplined um, on WFE, and um, you know, and and just to manage overall supply growth, uh, you know, maintain stable bit share, as we say. Yeah. Thanks, Mark. Thank you. And our next question comes from the line of Chris Queso from Wolf Research. Your question, please. Yes, thank you. Good evening. Um, the first question is about uh, any potential impact from, from some of the China capacity that we've had added, we've seen added, um, and, and naturally that's on the lower end of the market, and you've said you know, that you are, it's, it's becoming a, a, a smaller percentage of your business, but is is that causing some disruption in what you're seeing now, and is that having any meaningful impact uh, for you now? And then, you know, perhaps if you uh, if that becomes a, a smaller part of revenue next year, does, does it become a smaller impact if, if if there is any impact now? Yeah, Chris. So in terms of China uh, supply, yes, there has been uh, China supply in the market. It's primarily limited to. Uh, China-oriented, China-headquartered customers uh, who are uh, using uh, some of that supply or attempting to use it, and uh, generally focused on um, the product categories that have lower performance associated with them. So, uh, you know, DDR4, LP4 on the DRAM side, and um, and some of the Lower end products uh, on the NAND side, uh, especially in mobile and consumer SSD type of uh, product categories. Uh, our focus has been to uh, really have flat share on a global basis for DRAM and NAND, and within that, focus on the higher profit pools of the industry. And uh, we have um, made significant progress on that strategy, and you can see that in action now because um, we are in the midst of uh, what is the best product cycle that we have had in the history of Micron. We are gaining share in all of the uh, big, high-profit, um, 
portions of the product portfolio of the industry. We have um, HPM share gains happening, uh, really robust uh, share in high cap DIMS, um, pioneer and leaders in LP5 in the data center, data center SSDs at uh, record share levels. Um, so you can see how you know the portion of the business that's exposed to those kinds of trends in China are, um, are really becoming smaller as a percent of our revenue over time. Right. That's helpful. Thank you. Um, I guess as a follow-up, just kind of wrapping up all your CapEx comments, and you provided a lot of a, a lot of detail, obviously. But it is, um, you know, I, I guess what you what you've said in the past is basically that the amount of of big growth uh, or the CapEx that's oriented towards big growth is is actually really small. That this is mainly technology transitions, and as you uh, uh, you know migrate out to the next nodes that you're, I guess in, in some cases in the, in the past, you've actually been reducing capacity on that. Is, is the view as you go into 25 that there's no meaningful increase in, in bit capacity even as you migrate to some of these more advanced nodes in support of HBM? So, um, you know, Chris, we had talked about uh, in, you know, the last few calls in throughout fiscal 24 about this capital efficient um, approach that we were taking to uh, continuing technology conversions. For example, previous question, trying to convert more towards one beta, which was a D5 and LP5 optimized node from older nodes in an efficient way where we utilize some of the equipment that was for um, you know, the prior nodes and reduce wafer capacity structurally. So I think that's uh, you know sort of what you're referring to. Net, we do get bit growth capability still because there is still bit growth capability provided by the new technology, uh, but it's not as much as it would have been if we had maintained the uh, same wafer capacity, right? So that's sort of the the point and take is the wafer capacity comes down, the technology, new technology, um, you know, provides more bit growth, and net, we still do get uh, get. Uh, some, you know, get big growth. It's just not as much as it would have been. Um, and we believe this is something that's there throughout the industry, not just us, but both DRAM and NAND have had structural wafer capacity reductions in the industry um, uh, since peak levels in 2022. Um, and, you know, we're still, you know, going to be growing uh, bit share long term in line with the, um, the demand that we see and taking into account things like the HBM trade ratio, which it makes it more difficult to, to you know, sort of a headwind to bit growth because as, as the mix of wafers moving towards HBM grows, you know, the, the bit uh, capability for the, um, you know, for given uh, amount of wafer capacity is, is, is lower. All right. Thank you. Thank you. And our next question comes from the line of Harsh Kumar. From Piper yeah, Sanford, hey. your question, please. Yeah, hey, guys. First of all, congratulations. Seems like you guys are doing a good job with the turn in the cycle. Maybe a question for Simit or Mark. Um, I wanted to understand your visibility. I wanted to just – we get this question a lot from our investors. wanted to kind of understand maybe either the dynamics of a typical contract, how long it is, whether it's for a particular generation or even beyond, or – if you don't want to get that specific, maybe you could talk about your design engagements with your larger customer, the handful that make GPUs. Um, what kind of visibility do you have either with the contracts for supply or even your design contracts? And then I had a follow-up. Yeah. So in, in terms of um, the kind of agreements that we do with customers on, on this front, uh, we have a couple of different types. Um, we obviously, um, when we do LTAs or long-term agreements, they are focused on the next calendar year, typically. Um, and so it goes January to December of 2025 in this case. And we tend to have, you know, a visibility to the breakdown of bits in DRAM and NAND by quarter. Uh, typically, we uh, work with our customers to figure out uh, what kind of products they are, um, in advance, uh, and we get a, a understanding of that, you know, based on the 
product type, uh, what kind of node um, these bits are going to be manufactured in, so we can translate that to our uh, manufacturing uh, operations uh, demand signal. Now, um, when it comes to HBM, you know, so by the way, before we talk about HBM, so these tend to be mainly volume agreements that get negotiated for price on a you know, monthly or quarterly basis depending on you know, the customer and, um, and that pricing gets negotiated over time um, as we go through the um, fiscal and calendar year. Uh, when it comes to HBM, the agreements are different and the terms are different. The visibility is is uh, longer, and we tend to have uh, these agreements do have pricing already concluded for all of calendar 24 and 25. And um, the thing that is obviously different for HBM and also for LPD run that's going into the data center is we have very deep engagements with our customers. Um, on their R&D, um, the uh, roadmap that they're working on, whether it's GPUs or uh, ASIC accelerators that they're designing, um, requires multi-year outlook on the roadmap, uh, requires alignment on specs, alignment on features and functionality. When it comes to LP, you know, what kind of capability on the uh, RAS site they need, uh, reliability, availability, and serviceability that we design in and lead the industry on that. So these are like all multi-year engagements on the R&D front, um, and that is what gives us the confidence when we make the statements that we feel we'll have leadership in HBM4 and HBM4E as well. And as it gets to 4E, then we even talk to them about uh, customization that is going to be happening in 4E where uh, certain kinds of IP a customer may want to embed in our HBM product, and then it becomes um, you know, very different than a regular standard product. And when it becomes different than a standard product, then it comes with very different terms um, in terms of the business arrangement that we have. And that is part of what we say that you know, this growth of the data center, ultimately growth of AI is going to uh, create opportunities to transform the business model of the industry over time as well. So um, that's sort of a, a window into how those engagements happen. This is uh, super helpful. So another one is a follow-up. Another one that we get is there's this, this fear that we hear from some of our clients and investors that the third competitor will suddenly wake up and you know just get into the game. I, I suspect from what you're saying, it's not that easy that this this customer, the third customer, would have to get in line, you know, get some share, and uh, you would have your own share contracted out. So you, you're probably not likely to get surprised. Or am I mistaken in this assumption? I mean, we do have an expectation that ultimately, um, you know, all three of the large DRAM suppliers will be able to supply HPM. Uh, our goal is to have the best HBM on the planet uh, with the best performance, the best functionality and, and features and specs. Uh, I think it is really remarkable that a uh, 12 high product from Micron can have 20% lower power than an 8 high product from the nearest competitor. And that kind of power savings directly helps with um, saving of um, data center power needs because um, next to the processor, the DRAM is, you know, a huge part of um, what uh, what happens to the power consumption in the data center. So um, it's not just about our share, it's also about, you know, how the share can, how Micron's products can actually be leveraged for end-to-end um, -end advantage for our customers. And uh, consequently, we have seen very high demand for our product, and we feel confident that uh, we'll be able to ramp. I mean, all of the ramp that we have uh, for 25 is really limited by um, the supply and the rate and pace at which it can be brought to market, uh, because we definitely have um, a lot of demand for this industry leading product. Now, as you look past that, obviously, you know, there is always 
um, competition and we are not afraid of competition. Uh, and so we plan for our supply to ensure that it's in sync with the demand. And when we look at the industry model for supply and demand, we are capturing in that model what portion of the demand is HPM, what portion of the demand is non-HPM. And um, as you know, we have discussed in the uh, prior call as well uh, today uh, that the non-HPM portion of the industry is being compressed by the growth in HPM, and uh, overall, you know, bit growth can be brought online only at a certain rate and pace, especially when HPM is so capital intensive uh, to bring up so much volume so fast for the whole industry. And so um, we do feel that um, you know the mix changes will happen, um, but we'll be able to manage them well because the aggregate level of supply demand um, ought to be in a healthy place based on our outlook for how 2025 fiscal and calendar year is likely to evolve. Wonderful. Thank you, guys. Thanks so much. Thank you. And our next question comes from the line of Mahedi Husseini from Sheshkwana. Yes, thank you. Yes, thank you, operator. It's actually Mehdi Hosseini. Um, I just have a couple of follow-up questions. All the good questions have been asked. Mark, uh, given your OPEX increase of 15% and, and the fact that you're sold out for HBM and HBM uh, also uh, accounting for a higher mix of your capacity, do you, what is your confidence level in operating margin expanding throughout 25? And I have a couple of other follow-ups. Yeah, maybe um, the um, you know we're we're guiding you know one quarter at a time. We did provide color on on the industry or on the the year and the um, you know the the market environment. Um, you know, we as as it relates to the year and maybe to to help you with some uh, view on the year. Um, we do see. Um, you know, a healthy supply demand balance and, you know, a constructive environment to help with our uh, financial profitability through the year. Um, yeah, we've said we expect um, a significant revenue record um, and improved profitability. Um, we said today that um, our volumes uh, in the year would be second half weighted, um, which is, you know, uh, important for a number of things, including our drawdown of inventories and our, uh, you know, timing on node transition and output from that. Um, you know, uh, you know, maybe maybe one additional comment. Um, you know, keep in mind that in the second quarter, um, it tends to be a, you know, seasonally weaker quarter for us. So second fiscal quarter, which would be the calendar first quarter, um, tends to be a a a, a, a weaker quarter. Um, for the industry, so um, something to keep in mind. But overall, um, you know, a, a year fiscal 25 with increasing volumes, um, uh, second half fiscal year weighted, um, healthy supply demand environment, um, uh, executing really well on the product uh, roadmaps, and increasing mix of HBM, of high capacity DIMMs, LP data center SSD, um, and then a broadening of demand through the year, um, you know, from sure. what has been very strong AI data center to broader um, uh, traditional and then other markets. So you feel pretty good for, for, for at least fiscal year 25. You just don't want to set a bar and be so, so accountable to that bar, but you feel pretty good. Is that a fair way of summarizing everything you said? We've, we've given some positive indications for the year, and, you know, we're vigilant at all times about our cost structure, about our cost performance, about the discipline of our capital spend and maintaining stable bit share. And, you know, we're, we're you know, we think we're doing a good job of executing well and managing the risks in the business. Got it. Thank you. And a question from Manish. Um, everyone is focused on uh, uh, back-end yield associated with HBM and TSV, but can you help me understand how your front end 
yield compared to competitors, and the same thing for for the back end of HBM facilities. So kind of this could help us to better evaluate how well Micron is executing. So if you could just break it up in between the front end and back end and how it's compared to the peers, that would be great. Well, you know, I won't comment specifically, Mehdi, on, um, on, on competitors, but I will tell you that, and we have made comments on this before, we have made significant investments into uh, what we call smart manufacturing and artificial intelligence for many years now. Uh, and we focus those in manufacturing, uh, both between technology development and manufacturing, and at that interface as we ramp new nodes so that our yield ramps, and we have given some color on this in the past, our yield ramps continue node over node to be faster than, than prior nodes and, um, and more, more predictable and achieve higher uh, mature levels um, you know, as we move forward. So I think uh, you can um, you know, rest assured that all of those structural capabilities, we feel Micron is, is, is you know, very, very well positioned. Uh, and we are utilizing you know, this is, uh, you know, all the latest techniques and in fact many of the equipment vendors that we talk to tell us that we are leading in smart manufacturing, you know, utilization of these techniques to be able to improve efficiency in the fab as well as yield performance and quality performance. So, you know, I think, um, you know, feel good about, about that. And, uh, you know, I, I already on the, you know, previously on the call, um, you know, I think it was, um, uh, uh, was it Harlan who asked about yields on HBM and, and you know, just continue to, to reiterate how we feel good about where they are, we feel good about where they're going. Um, and uh, uh, and being able to support the you know the HBM uh, right. uh, opportunity that but, we have ahead. Yeah. Yep. But I guess I was asking specifically for any kind of qualitative color uh, uh, comparing front and a back end, not overall yield. Yeah, you know, I I, I think that um, we uh, you know I'm not going to sort of comment specifically about, um, you know, our peers, but I think we have, I, I have, we have very good yields, right? And I think I, I feel good about, about where they are for both the front end and the back end. And that, that the, you know, you're kind of asking about pro back end, I'll say across our, our, you know, back end product lines uh, across the board, I feel like we have very, very good manufacturing capability, um, both from assembly, but also test capability. A lot of the yield capability that we have is our, uh, comes from our, um, customized development of our own test uh, tester equipment and tester hardware, which allows us to be able to have lower cost test equipment as well as uh, equipment solutions and testing solutions that are specifically tuned uh, to our products. In many ways, we design our tester hardware in line with our product uh, design so that we're able to, to test more efficiently and with better fidelity such that we can improve yields while we're improving outgoing quality as well. So, you know, I feel like we have very, very strong um, capabilities in both front-end yields as well as back-end yields, and on back-end both in assembly as well as in test. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And our next question comes from the line of Brian Chin from Stiefel. Your question, please. Hi there. Good afternoon, and uh, congratulations on the results and ex execution. Um, maybe related to, to something that was just discussed a moment ago. We, we had, yeah, you know, this is our modeling. We'd modeled the February quarter revenue kind of sideways relative to November for some of the reasons that were stated around seasonality and kind of this, um, you know, some inventories maybe that have built up in consumer. Maybe just to deconstruct that a little bit. Um, when you think about uh, seasonality, Mark, can you define what that looks like in a February quarter from a bit shipment standpoint? And then in terms of the portfolio mix, which kind of works in the company's favor in the November quarter, driving some of that sequential growth, why, why would it not be, why would that mix effect not be similar in the February quarter relative to November? Yeah, let me, let me start and then maybe submit can can add on this. Um, you know, Brian, we're not going to guide to the second quarter, and um, I understand the, the interest in, in you know, learning, learning about our view on that quarter. But right now, um, you know, just the contours of the year, um, we see, um, you know, strong data center demand um, through this first half of the year, fiscal year. And then through the year, um, that um, 
uh, AI related server demand continuing uh, to be strong and then it broadening out we're seeing traditional server volumes increase now and then in other markets see that broadening out um, and um, and as I mentioned earlier the our volumes we see being heavier weighted in the second half of the fiscal year um, and you know there will be some favorable as you say because some of these high performance markets here that are strong um, yeah there there is continued um, uh, favorable mix growth um, through the year um, on, on on you know as we ramp HBM we've given enough uh, markers on that profile uh, but also high capacity DIMS LP um, and data center uh, SSD we see continuing to grow so um, I think submit anything to add yeah I think I think Mark provided um, the important uh, relevant color the only thing I'll mention is the second quarter uh, like Mark said we're not providing any guidance but just in terms of uh, you know how you think about it definitely the uh, ramp of our um, higher margin data center products will continue throughout the year so the second quarter will get benefit from that but it is also as Mark said a quarter where there is uh, seasonality of CQ1 that is part of our FQ2 and also you know we mentioned this point in our prepared remarks about um, the PC OEMs and to a lesser extent smartphone OEMs um, um, working to get their inventory to a healthier place by spring of 2025 which again encapsulates the uh, FQ2 uh, time frame uh, so those are some of the things to keep in mind um, which is what leads us to that second half of fiscal year 25 second half of calendar 25 should be strong broadening of demand drivers um, AI PCI smartphone uh, mix improvements helping uh, on top of the full year fiscal and calendar 25 data center robust demand continuing Okay, great. That, that's uh, that's actually super helpful. Maybe just a very quick follow up. But from a, a timing standpoint, wh when roughly does your 12 high 3E product need to be qualified by in order to be on track with your HBM production and shipment schedule that you've communicated? Yeah, so our HBM um, 8 high continues to ship in volume, and we are working very closely with our customers to figure out uh, what their plans for. Um, switching to 12 high R based on uh, of course the qualifications but more importantly the readiness of their products to leverage 12 high and the readiness of the ecosystem to ramp 12 high because 12 high obviously more complex product than than 8 high so will go through its own uh, yield ramp um, and our expectation is that uh, we are going to be in um, we are going to be selling this product in volume starting in um, early part of uh, calendar 25 and then throughout 2025 um, every quarter the mix of 12 high will keep increasing and the second half of calendar 25 uh, you'll have a very large mix of 12 high and in order to support that obviously you know we provide samples to customers ahead of time we go through a call process and uh, we have mentioned that uh, production uh, ready 12 high samples have been provided uh, to our customers and we provided you some of the expectations we have of our industry leadership of that 12 high product with the 20 percent lower power consumption versus others eight high product so uh, we feel really good about our 12 high and it should constitute the majority of our sales in the second half of calendar 25 assuming our customers make the transitions on the timelines that um, they are currently expecting um great yeah. thank you very much yeah another sad we feel we feel good about where we are with uh, you know, the 12 high summit mentioned we've started sampling with customers who are getting feedback and learning to be able to prepare for that that ramp that summit mentioned that'll that'll start in um, in early calendar year 25 thanks
Thank you. And this does conclude the question and answer session as well as today's program. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for your participation. You may now disconnect. Good day.